from everyone. My name is Elizabeth Melanthi, and I'm one of the co-presidents of the Harvard Law School's Animal Law Society. Thank you all for attending our final Animal Law Week event. I'd like to, to take a moment to thank today's event co-sponsors, the Animal Law and Policy Program, Harvard Law School's Effective Altruism, the Food Law and Policy Clinic, the Food Law Society, and the Women's Law Association. If you have any questions for our panelists today, please submit them through the Q&A function and we'll pose them after the presentation. Today's Animal Law Week event features Sana Baig, Chief of Staff at the Good Food Institute, who recently served as a member of the Biden-Harris USDA transition team and formerly served in the USDA during the Obama administration. The title of her presentation is From Regulation to Reinvention, an Inside Look at the Evolving Politics of Meat. At GFI, Sana manages the organization's strategic planning, execution, and evaluation efforts. She brings both federal and local government-related ex expertise to her role at GFI, where she works with the leadership team to execute the organization's global strategic vision. Sana previously was a program director at the National Association of Counties, where she managed more than a dozen grant-funded programs designed to increase local government's capacity for resilience and economic development planning. Prior to that, Sana spent nearly six years during the Obama administration serving as a political appointee at the USDA in a variety of capacities, including as an advisor to the Secretary of Agriculture on place-based and rural infrastructure investments, and as the acting deputy White House liaison. Most recently, Sana served on the Biden-Harris transition team as a member of the USDA agency review team. Please join me warmly in welcoming Sana Beg. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that kind introduction. Um, I am seriously pleased and honored to be here and to help close out um, Animal Law Week here at Harvard Law School. Um, I've enjoyed the, the event so far, and it really is a privilege to be able to speak with all of you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here quickly. And hopefully that works. Okay. Um, so I really have a, a short amount of time with you today. So what I hope to do is to discuss at a super high level how the political and technological landscape for meat has evolved in the US over the past nearly 15 years that I've been following food systems work, first within and now outside of government. And namely from my perspective, this has meant a shift. Um, oh, sorry, not seeing screen share. Give me one moment. There we go, hopefully that works now. Okay. Um, so namely, from my perspective, this has meant a shift uh, in focus or mostly regulatory oversight of the conventional meat industry to now what is really the creation of an entirely new alternative protein ecosystem with products that, that thankfully are increasingly competing on taste, price, and convenience. So uh, I will attempt to piece together this broader narrative by sharing some of my professional experiences. So um, as mentioned, I'll, I'll touch upon my time at USDA. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the political appointments process and the presidential transition team. And then I'll discuss our work to reinvent meat at the Good Food Institute. And since I have the opportunity to speak to some of the brightest legal minds and future leaders, one of my goals today is, is to inspire you to consider a career in public and nonprofit service. Um, and I'll, I'll close with a few examples of the, mon the momentum building to address the myriad ch challenges stemming from industrialized food production today and how you can have an immediate and enormous impact in protecting people, planet, and of course, animals. So um, I'll, I'll start here with an, with an admission. Uh, I am strongly biased toward public service because my father was a career civil servant. He worked at the state and federal levels, primarily at the Environmental Protection Agency, so longtime regulator um, over air pollution for over four decades. Uh, I spent my teenage years in the DC area and I knew I wanted to follow in his footsteps. And I, I started with early internships at the USDA and, and the National Labor Relations Board. Um, several years later at GFI, 
um, where as mentioned, I serve as the organization's chief of staff. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to, uh, to shape and execute um, a global strategy that will accelerate the landscape for alternative proteins. It's a really challenging and exciting job because as you all know, unlikely if you're tuning in, um, the, this ecosystem is, is pretty brand new. And so to work in, in a startup space, um, we have to be nimble and adaptive as that ecosystem evolves quite rapidly. And then finally, um, the seal here in the bottom right, most recently I was uh, mo uh, very honored to serve as a, a volunteer on the Biden-Harris transition team where, where honestly my, my experience came quite full circle. Um, but I, I really wanna focus first on my story that started in, in 2011. So basically almost exactly a decade ago uh, when I arrived bright eyed and bushy tailed at the USDA headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, so perhaps like some of you, my motivation for getting involved in, in food and agriculture issues was driven by a, a, a real deep desire to understand why our system is set up the way that it is. So particularly how and why factory farms and animal agriculture interest had gained such dom dominance really at a time when it was clear, at least to me, that what we needed was to rein in the externalities of protein production while bolstering things like specialty crop production. Um, just things did not add up to me when I looked uh, at things like the, the food pyramid, for example, and what doctors were saying about how people should be eating. Um, so what happened in 2011 was I landed in an office that USDA called the White House Liaison's Office which uh, among many other things is responsible for, of course, working with the White House to place and manage the roughly 250 political appointees at the Department of Agriculture. Um, and I'll note, of course, that there are similar offices that exist across all cabinet agencies. And what that first experience taught me uh, was a really simple and powerful lesson. People are policy and every single person appointed to these positions had a particular set of experiences, interests, and, and motivations that influenced their decisions and their decision-making. Um, and, and I wanna say, of course, this matters a lot <laughs> at a department that has um, about 100,000 100, employees um, domestically and around the world, uh, over 29 agencies and offices, one of the largest field structures and budgets in the federal government. Um, and did I mention that fewer than 250 political appointees make these policy and resource allocation decisions across 50 states? Uh, 250 right at the top there over a, a pretty sprawling structure of 100,000 100, employees. So People, people really equal policy. And so uh, an example um, that I often thought of and, and might've seen in practice was you know, something that I don't think will be hard for you to imagine. Um, so for example, how differently the, the appointed head, um, the leader of USDA's food safety mission area would approach poultry line speed regulations if they were a former meat industry executive versus a labor union leader representing slaughterhouse workers. Um, kind of an extreme example, but, but I do think that that general sense permeates, not just again within the political ranks, but also at the career levels, which I saw firsthand. Um, so it didn't take long for me to really become kind of obsessed with comparing professional and personal backgrounds of these leaders to the policy and regulatory decisions coming out of their respective offices. I also noticed things like the types of stakeholders that gained access to these officials, um, which speaking engagements were prioritized, and even where USDA attention and resources seemed to flow, flow more heavily. Again, it, it all led back to the people in those roles. And, and to me, it really, it really begs the question, why weren't more people with deep backgrounds in things like animal protection, um, food sustainability and justice, civil rights and nutrition, overwhelmingly placed into these critical roles? Um, so the, let me step back then for a moment to provide a quick snapshot of political appointments within the federal government. Out of a workforce of 
about 2 million federal uh, employees, only about 4,000 people are presidentially appointed. And of those 1,200 appointments, uh, I'm sorry, of those 4,000 appointments, only 1,200 really require Senate confirmation. And if you're curious, you can see here uh, what is uh, commonly referred to as the plum book. Uh, this is a list of, of political positions by agency uh, across the federal government. It's updated every four years and the most recent version came out in December, 2020. So you can get a sense of what kind of roles are available, who was even in those roles um, you know, during the Trump administration um, and kind of how they widely uh, across agencies and departments. So the, the purpose of the president's appointees, of course, is to enable the administration to, to get control uh, of a sprawling federal bureaucracy uh, and to keep it accountable to voters. And of course, to deliver on the platform that the, that the president and his team campaigned on. I also wanna note that uh, really historically, appointees are sourced from a few key arenas. So of course you have campaign staffers, um, folks from the Hill, from congressional offices, people from think tanks, nonprofits, academia, uh, top donors, of course, um, and a range of industry representatives. I'll note that um, in 2009, and really the early days of, of the, the first uh, Obama uh, term, I recall that it was mostly campaign staff that overwhelmingly filled these positions early on. Um, fast forward to, to 2021, and I noticed that the administration is pulling more heavily from, from nonprofits, think tanks, academia, and of course, uh, former Obama appointees. I also recall that back then, it felt like finding top talent with the requisite backgrounds and passion who are willing to serve in, the, in these time-bound roles um, and often taking significant pay cuts and having to move to DC was an acute challenge. And, and this was especially true at a department that has such a unique um, and little understood mandate. In, in fact, I remember in those early days of, of that first term, um, sitting in the White House Liaison's office, it was often a negotiation. There was some convincing and persuasion that needed to happen um, to, to kind of ask folks to come and serve at USDA instead of you know, places like the State Department or energy or commerce. And uh, the number of people who conflated USDA and FDA really never ceased to amaze me either. And, and honestly, it still doesn't. Um, I will note though, um, especially given my, my recent work on the transition team, uh, it's clear that interest and competition is much fiercer today. And I think that the talent is even higher quality. Um, a couple of reasons, I think partly, as you all know, appointees in the Trump administration became household names. Um, people were aware kind of of these positions and the clout that they had. And I think secondly, um, in, in the years since, I think the food and agriculture space has really gained a lot more prominence. Um, these, are, these are now household issues. People care where their food comes from. They're aware of kind of the ills of, of factory farming. They're, they're aware of the connections between food and climate. So with that, I, I do want to talk a little bit about process because I think for, for some people, it could probably feel like kind of a black box. Um, I want to kind of open, open the lid a little bit here for you. Um, at, at the Senate confirmed le level, again, I mentioned how few those positions are relative to the whole. Um, these folks are often recruited by the Presidential Personnel Office. They're leaders across the public and private sectors, of course, and really their views on key policy issues are well documented. And the White House really does their, their uh, due diligence to ensure that their nominees are in super close alignment with the policy preferences and values of the president. Um, many of them uh, often, of course, um, solicit le letters of recommendation from various interest groups to um, you know, kind of push for their appointment. And, and often the most successful ones have internal champions as well. Um, but of course, that's just 
one chunk of, of the, the, the general whole of, of, of appointees. At lower levels, beyond campaign staff, a huge source of talent, as I mentioned, was congressional staffers, people who bring legislative experience to the executive branch, meaning that they're, they're able to ensure that the president's agenda can be carried out um, through the appropriations process and via critical pieces of legislation like the Farm Bill. And I do want to make a quick note uh, on the Farm Bill because um, the most recent one passed in December of 2018 and it, it expires in, in 2023. That means that preparations are gearing up. The next two years are going to be critical in shaping the, that next Farm Bill. Um, and I know here I'm, I'm talking about executive branch experience and the importance of it, uh, but that's really because that's what I know. I strongly believe that for, for those of you interested, I think working on the Hill can be equally impactful, especially when it comes to advancing issues like animal welfare, food justice, and climate resilience. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it makes you a stronger candidate, especially for management roles um, and external facing roles, because you have that, that kind of Rolodex of networks um, that, that could be really, really key in, in getting uh, policy issues advanced. That said, um, again, this is really not a secret, but people, everybody actually must apply through the same portal. Um, it is a, available right at the White House website. You can pop your information in there and, and get into their database. Um, of course, it's really not as easy um, as just um, submitting your information, as I mentioned, letters of support, knowing folks. Um, there, there's a couple of different mechanisms by which your, your application can really be flagged, but, but everybody starts with that first simple step. And you'll also see, I find it really interesting that the Washington Post has a, has a handy appointee tracker, which um, I think, again, if you follow over time, will demonstrate how, how people really are policy. Uh, I do also just want to talk for a minute uh, about values. So when I served on the Biden-Harris transition team, um, I was asked to be a volunteer interviewer for prospective appointees to USDA. And as you can see, President Biden made it clear from the, from the start that his administration will not tolerate, um, for lack of a better word, assholes. <laughs> Uh, so, of course, every administration, though, does differ in its priorities, but I, I do want to share just a few general traits that um, we typically look for in appointees. Um, the first, uh, to me, is, is demonstrated leadership of others. So I'll, I'll venture a, a guess and a bet here that everybody tuning in right now is smart. You either are currently or will be a leader. But, but I'd say that to be successful in the public arena, you must really deeply understand and want to motivate others to work with a team and to put your ego to the side. The, the federal bureaucracy is, is super complex and you'll need to lead a career workforce that may or may not agree with you or your policy goals, quite, quite frankly. Um, so leading with compassion and curiosity is really key, and, and we look for that in, in people's statements and their resumes. Um, secondly, probably not a surprise, but eager, eagerness and flexibility are also super important. Again, you have to be really motivated to serve the greater good, um, which I think also means a willingness to, to adapt and to rec recognize that things will not always go your way. Um, and honestly, the, the, the path is usually not linear. So being willing to kind of jump around um, and accept missions that, that might not be directly in your wheelhouse. Um, so, so finally, and I think this is, is most true for the current administration, uh, but a demonstrated commitment to the core values of justice and, and racial equity. And uh, really on that note, I will say I'm super excited and, and heartened to, to see firsthand that this administration is already the most diverse in our nation's history. There, there was a commitment from the start when the, when the transition, the central transition team really started forming, I think at some point, you know, in the spring or summer of last year, um, to, to ensure that this team looks like America. And again, I witnessed this firsthand and it makes me excited 
about, again, the policy implications of including such diverse voices at the highest levels of government. So let me talk for a moment about my service on the, on the transition team. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I was a member of the USDA Agency Review Team, or the ART um, for short. And I, I will say there are different names for, for these kind of transition team um, groups, uh, depending on the administration. Sometimes they're called landing teams, or sometimes they're called beachhead teams, but, but ours was called the, the Agency Review Team. And, and who they are, what they do, they're really groups of transition st uh, staffers who work closely with officials um, across each federal agency to understand ongoing activities, budgets, pending regulations, and really any other information that would allow the incoming personnel, the new administration to hit the ground running. Uh, they also work closely with the central transition team to determine based on their scope and their analysis, whether an initial kind of policy implementation plan is feasible and will help um, provide guidance on, on how to tweak those plans uh, based on their scoping of the agencies and, and some of the changes that happened since the previous, in this case, democratic administration. And, and, and back to kind of people and, and traits, the ART also provides um, important insights about what skills and traits may be helpful in certain roles. Um, essentially understanding what types of people are needed to meet the moment. And of course, what, what a moment we're in, right? This, uh, this transition was, was the first and probably the only transition in US presidential history that occurred virtually, which you know, obviously presented a whole uh, different set of challenges, a unique set of challenges on top of the unprecedented challenges we're already facing in terms of the, the ongoing pandemic. Um, what was a, a you know, unheard of two week delay in ascertainment, which doesn't sound like much, but when you're really trying to focus and get a lot of work done between a short period of time between the election day and in inauguration, um, two weeks can make all of the difference, particularly on the national security front. Um, other, other kind of challenges and problems that, you know, are no secret, uh, the, the incoming team inherited a, a decimated federal workforce, um, and particularly at USDA, a team that was uh, reorganized, uh, one that uh, had the kind of dire consequences for scientific and, and climate expertise at the department. So understanding not just kind of what happened, but what the incoming team could potentially do about it in order to meet again the, the, the core uh, priorities of, of, the, of the transition team and the incoming government, which in this case for President Biden was uh, building back better, um, addressing the COVID, uh, COVID crisis, the, the climate emergency, advancing equity and, and rebuilding the economy. And of course, all of this is happening as, as you all know, during a, a very um, a tense, a political landscape in which we had a, 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 a president in office that refused to concede. So um, the teams are really working around the clock here to try to figure out how we could get good, accurate information. You know, in the in the time that we didn't have ascertainment, that we couldn't we couldn't um, officially talk to to current agency officials, um, and then you know a shortened time to kind of get plans in place, and of course select for. Who, who should be a part of that incoming team? And, and of course, a lot more there and, and maybe we can get to some of that in questions. So I, I would like to turn back here for a moment to, uh, to my time at USDA. Um, the, this first picture here on the left is um, during one of the USDA IFTAR dinners that I had the, the chance to organize during my time there. Uh, the middle is of course, uh, I think that was my farewell photo with the, the Secretary of Agriculture, who's of course now returned, uh, Secretary Vilsack. And then finally up there in the, in the top right, um, the chance as an appointee to, to visit the White House and um, to celebrate our service after, after a very um, challenging and rewarding eight years. So while I was at USDA, I had the chance to serve in, in five different capacities. And by the end of the Obama administration in 2016, um, I was an advisor to Secretary Vilsack. Um, 
I was also the only uh, semi-closeted vegan, um, one of the only women of color, uh, uh, only person in that secretary's office from a Muslim background. And I believe I was, I was the youngest advisor as well. Um, talk about, you know, kind of being the odd person out. And uh, although, although um, I have a lot of stories that I could share from my time there, I wish I, wish I did have more time for that. Um, things like being, being taken on a, on a guided tour by the owner of, of Fair Oaks Farm, for example, and being cajoled up on stage to pull a dairy calf out of its mother. Um, I, I, I won't go too deep into that, but instead, I think what might be more useful is, is to offer a few lessons, a few lessons learned that, uh, that you might find useful as, as you potentially consider uh, a, a career in government, and, and especially those of you interested um, in animal protection, uh, sustainable food systems, and the like. So the, the first thing I'll note is I uh, had to be very careful to check my own biases and to really take a, a learning posture during my time at the department. This was super important for me, um, uh, especially when, when meeting with livestock and dairy farmers. I uh, surprisingly, um, fortunately, had the chance to attend meetings with members of the dairy board, um, the beef board, sheep producers, pork council, just to name a few. And, and as if anybody else has grown up in the suburbs or in the city, uh, like, like you, I, I didn't have much exposed exposure to animal farmers um, other than kind of what I had read about the harms and, and the, the kind of problems associated um, with this industry. So certainly I walked in with some preconceived notions, but, but what I'll, I'll learn and what I learned, and I don't wanna to be too trite, but this was really, really stark to me and something I'll never forget. Uh, farmers of, of all stripes that I met with were some of the kindest people that I seriously have ever met in my life. And shockingly, um, animal farmers were, in fact, some of the most accommodating and understanding, uh, particularly when I would ask for a vegetarian meal at their conference or their meeting. They was, you know, they would say, oh, you know, I get it, my, my, my niece is vegetarian or something like that. And it was really shocking to me because when I would go home, I would you know, kind of, I wouldn't get maybe that same level of support from my own family. So despite kind of how I, how I started and my, my, you know, initial sense of, of, you know, who these animal farmers were and kind of what they were behind, I, it, it changed completely once I actually um, took a learning posture and got to know them, tra traveled to their farms and understood how, the, how they operated and what their needs were and kind of what they were trying to do. Um, and, and specifically, I learned that they were trying to run a business, provide for their family, keep their connection with the land, all things that I, I really couldn't, you know, um, be mad about. <laughs> but I, what, I, what I did learn, though, that if, if I wanted to create change, and I, I still very much did, and obviously still very much do, um, it would have to be by working with them and, and not by vilifying them. And, and this really goes back to the point of people are policy as well. So again, appointees change over administrations, but career staff really are the ones kind of with, with the keys to the kingdom, if you will. And when you look at some of the marketing and, and promotion programs, particularly within USDA, you'll recognize that the people who are you know, interfacing with, uh, with industry leaders have really deep personal connections with them. They might have some shared family background. They might be, they often come from, you know, from, from rural and agriculture communities. And so you really have to think about that aspect of, of kind of why, uh, why the system exists in the way that it does is because people are, uh, run these relationships. And, and again, they bring their own personal experiences and motivations to work. Um, so the, the next thing I would say, and I've kind of mentioned this a little bit is, is staying, staying curious um, and saying yes, which um, for people who are laser focused on what it is that they wanna do, I at, at that time was pretty open. I didn't quite know exactly what it, what it was that I, that I wanted to do or, or where I could have an impact. So I was really willing to take on projects and assignments that didn't really always make sense at first. Um, but, but everything I learned from, you know, working on 
uh, presidential appointments to working on rural economic development to supporting the secretary and the, and the president in their support of the, the opioid um, pent, uh, epidemic response um, really helped me get to where I am today. And I, I use a lot of that knowledge and especially those connections with people even to this day. And like I said, taking the time to build those relationships with career staff and not just you know, um, civil servants, but the, the members of the security team and the custodial staff, really every single person who I interacted with every day, I wanted to get to know them and understand their motivations as well. Um, like I said, appointees come and go, but, but these folks have all of the institutional knowledge that again, um, you really need in order to, to take uh, change forward. Um, and in fact, um, it was these prior relationships that I formed at USDA that allowed me to um, start from a position of trust when I was on the transition team, folks reach out to me, you know, former officials that, that said, hey, I wanna share this with you. I, I think you're gonna use this information for good. Um, and it, it made all of the difference, again, in preparing the incoming team with, with the, the best knowledge that we could provide uh, about what they were going to face. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I do want to, of course, talk a little bit about the Good Food Institute, where, where I work today. Um, and I think, again, if, for, for those of us who are joining this call, I, I don't think I need to convince anybody um, that the, the current way of producing meat, dairy, and eggs is, is truly unsustainable in, and inefficient. Um, but, but also, really trying to convince people not to eat these products um, is it, not working and, and, and not going to really create the level of, of change and pivot that we need at a time when um, consumption is going up all over the world. So GFI is on a mission to create meat, dairy, and eggs um, using plants, cell cultivation, and fermentation, which are, um, as we call them, the, the three pillars of alternative proteins. We're essentially making meat, uh, but in a better way. And I, again, I won't, I won't get into the specifics here, um, but I, I'll encourage you to, to check out our newly revamped website, which just launched last month at gfi.org, um, where I think <laughs> practically you can get a master's degree in alternative proteins. We have a ton of resources available as well as um, a free open online course that you can, you can um, sign up for and take modules to learn all about uh, all proteins. Um, we can also take a take a look around and see how we're approaching, primarily from from a, a scientific perspective, the the really difficult challenges of getting plant based, cultivated, and, and fermenta uh, fermentation derived products to taste, smell, cook, and look like meat. Um, and our, our, one of our primary focuses, and, and, and we, we certainly have many, particularly as we expand globally, but, but a, a central kind of core to our mission is a focus on, on filling the most pressing scientific white spaces through federal funding advocacy and our own don donor funded um, competitive research grant program. So for example, this year, um, our grants program is soliciting applications to uh, research uh, from researchers to focus on addressing what is uh, one of the most diverse and popular product uh, categories of meat that, that remains pretty elusive, which is structured whole cut meat and seafood. I'm really excited to see the proposals that come in and, um, and to see kind of the result of, of that research, which will be publicly available as one of GFI's core, uh, core goals is to, um, uh, share knowledge freely. So certainly um, there is so much more that I could say about the work that we do, but we're, I, I really wanna focus attention on some, some good news. And I think some reasons for optimism and hope, um, particularly um, a few recent wins that demonstrate huge momentum in this space. So you'll see here uh, a shout out from, from Bill Gates. He recently endorsed GFI's policy priorities and actually said in his, in his brand new book that all rich countries should move to 100% synthetic beef. And uh, of course, we're, we're pretty excited and enthusiastic about, about this take, but I, I also recognize that it's quite remarkable when, when I think about it, 
for, for a few reasons, but especially thinking back to my time at USDA uh, a few short years ago, there was really no concept of, of you know, synthetic meat or plant-based protein um, at all. Um, there was no talk of, of you know, things like the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger. They just really didn't exist. This has been, um, you know, within the past five years, it's, we, we've seen this tremendous momentum. And again, uh, the focus at that time, as far as I could tell, for people who kind of understood what was going on within the industrial animal agriculture industry was to really focus on um, mitigating the harms of, of the existing meat industry. That was, you know, really focused on things like incremental efficiencies um, and, and, and feed and uh, animal genetics, uh, things like tighter regulations, um, as well as, you know, kind of some at that time, you know, cutting ed edge technologies like precision agriculture and, and biodigester. So trying to improve from the fringes um, rather than, than reinvent and, and create something new altogether. Uh, another thing that I'm, I'm super um, enthused about, and I think is a, is a remarkable sign of, of how far we've come, is that plant-based food is, is no longer limited to startups, um, nor is it limited to, you know, legacy vegetarian brands like the kind of uh, hockey puck type veggie burgers of, of years past. Um, and, and what that means really, and what, what's driving that is that we have the, the big players in meat and in the food industry that have taken notice um, of the advancements in this in this space. So as you see, the, the, of the top six meat companies in the US, all of them are now active in plant-based meat through their own product lines or investments. The Tyson CEO even said that he expects Tyson to be, quote, a market leader in alternative protein which is experiencing double digit growth and could someday be a billion dollar business for our company. So yes, you heard right. Tyson, Smithfield, JBS, Cargill, or Mel Conagra have now all developed plant-based meat and or blended products. Um, many of them are also invested in, in cultivated meat companies as well. Um, and it, it was quite a, a, a remarkable evolution from, from where we, we were even five years ago, as I said. Um, on the on the cultivated meat side, in in December there were there were really two major major milestones that I want to I, I do want to mention here as well. So, in in December, our GFI Israel team um, worked with uh, wor worked with uh, ALF to arrange a tasting for Netanyahu um, for cultivated meat, and he became the first world leader to actually taste it to try it. Um, he also committed to appointing somebody in his administration. To, to work on these issues um, and, and take them forward, which is pretty amazing if, if you think about it and uh, if you think about how what that might take in the US. And then almost, I think more importantly on the, in terms of major milestones, we had um, Singapore, which became the first country in the world to grant regulatory approval for cultivated meat, which we, you can see here, their, their chicken nuggets, um, being being served for the first time on restaurant uh, on a restaurant menu there locally so um it's uh, obviously not for sale yet um, anywhere else in the world but singapore um, has ushered in an, a new era of possibility and a new sense of urgency i think for governments all over the world to recognize that you know they they should really be taking this seriously and so with that um, I would love to talk a little bit more about, about areas of, of opportunities that exist in the, in the months and years ahead. Um, and this is on the alternative protein front, uh, but also more broadly. So um, as, as those of you who kind of have been following this space, you know that the, the FDA and USDA are leading the charge on the regulatory framework for, for cultivated meat in the United States. Um, I, they, you know, established a joint framework, put some information out there, but I think this administration will be the one to actually put it into practice. Um, and I, I hope uh, soon grant regulatory approval for cultivated meat so that we don't fall behind um, as, as governments uh, across the world, particularly in, in Asia, are jumping on this opportunity. Um, in addition to that, there's a progress, I think, that we're looking forward to on the 
uh, on the nomenclature front, um, looking for common sense um, labeling for plant-based and cultivated meat. So thinking about um, the state level bills that have popped up over the past two years that uh, in state legislatures really all over the United States and GFI has spent a lot of our resources combating these bills and we've been successful in a, um, more than a dozen states but you know the, the efforts really continue. Um, and this, these, these censorship bills really prevent um, alternative protein producers from, from uh, playing on a level playing field with conventional producers and so they are banning terms like veggie burgers and in some case even um, fining uh, alt protein producers and, and even um, requiring jail time if they use these these terms on their labels which is pretty crazy <laughs> um, so uh, one thing that I'm also really excited about is um, it, particularly with with Secretary Vilsack who has taken the reins of, of USDA again somebody who really understands the importance of agricultural research and, and federal R&D funding. Um, I think that there is gonna be a huge focus on this front, um, particularly, hopefully if, if GFI is successful and our partners to fund research into essential alt protein uh, questions and needs across, across the value chain, but particularly on things like crop optimization. You know, what are, what are the best crops used to be using uh, for plant-based meat? And, and how, do we, how do we improve texture, taste, and some of the other factors that I mentioned earlier? And, and really, I think it was Vilsack who said that for every $1 invested into federal R&D funding, we get a, a ten, you know, $10 back into the economy. So we really recognize the, the power of these types of investments. And we've seen them work, obviously, time and time again, particularly in the renewable energy space. Um, so on a slightly different tone, um, I, I also think that we'll, we'll probably see some traction on um, organic animal welfare regulations, which you know the Obama administration worked fairly hard on to, to try to get into place before the end of the, the term, um, but that was you know quashed by by Trump. Um, and I think we'll see hopefully some some traction on this front as well, because consumers currently you know I, I don't think have a, an understanding at all over um, over what organic uh, regulations really mean in the in terms of animal welfare. There's a lot of loopholes um, and, and a lot of kind of misinformation out there. Um, a couple of other things include the rise of specialty crops, which I kind of mentioned before. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the not just funding, but also um, staff resources, as you can imagine, during my time there were were highly skewed toward commodities and. Um, if, you know, based on what I understand of the Trump administration, this kind of skewed even further in that direction during that administration. I'm also excited about urban agriculture and certain things like, uh, you know, indoor farming that might get a lot more love in the, in the upcoming farm bill based on uh, champions in the Senate. Um, and then finally here, which obviously is, is really pertinent right now, is an increased understanding um, and, and reckoning with the, with the fact that there is a link between factory farms um, and the conditions they're in and, and pandemics and emerging zoonotic diseases. So perhaps we'll see new regulations, um, again, in addition to huge investments into emerging market-based solutions. And then really quickly here, um, I, I think that there are a few glimmers of hope in the new administration. Uh, President Biden announced a very lofty goal for the US to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And as you can see from, from Secretary Vilsack's recent comments here um, to Politico, uh, thankfully climate change is now a priority at USDA. Um, it was really, really talked about infrequently and at a, a kind of a, a really small level um, in, the, in the kind of terms climate smart agriculture back in the Obama years. Um, so you can see he, he really understands that we couldn't meet that goal without unlocking full resources of the Ag Department. So um, early days, for sure, the team is still being built, um, but it's heartening to see him underscore the critical role that Ag plays. And of course, the recognition that pharma, farmers also see this um, consumer appetite as an opportunity. So I am going to end it there. Um, and thank you all very much for, for your attention and time. I hope that you feel a little bit more optimistic about the all evolving landscape for meat and, and the progress to come um, in, the, in the coming months and years. And, and of course, as I said, I hope some of you will consider service in the administration on the Hill 
um, or in a range of nonprofits that are do, doing incredible work on these issues. And uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that GFI, of course, is also hiring and we happen to have a couple of Harvard Law School alum on our team. Um, so please check out our page for opportunities. And um, with that, I am going to open the floor for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was uh, incredibly informative. Um, and I, again, I really like the message of, uh, of, of, of encouraging students to go into government service, which uh, surprisingly is less common than one would think here at Harvard Law School. A lot of our faculty um, serve administrations, but it's often not a first thought for, for graduating students. Um, got a couple questions that have come in. Um, one I'll just immediately follow up with given your last slide. Um, you know, animal advocates saw the appointment of Secretary Vilsack as uh, a bit bittersweet given his previous tenure during the Obama administration, yet still being a better option than someone like Heidi Heitkamp, who was also being considered. Um, what are your expectations for Secretary Vilsack and how did his nomination affect the transition process that you were part of? It's a loaded question, but a, a very important one for sure. I mean, certainly we know, you know, that for he, Bill Sack was former governor of Iowa as well, right? One of the largest kind of pork producing um, and soy states in the corn states in the in the world and in the country. But I think um, a, a couple of things to, to keep in mind here is that, as I mentioned, this was a, a, a very difficult time in the country's history. And uh, those of us on the on the agency review team really had no idea what you know what the what the inner council the, the Biden team was really thinking about in terms of these you know most senior appointments across the administration. So I think you know people obviously had their their preferences and their opinions over who would be selected, but we weren't we weren't there to um, you know weigh in on on that appointment. We were there to help set up whoever the incoming team was going to be for success. How it affected our work because I think Secretary um, Vilsack was announced as a nominee kind of part way into um, our work sometime I think in either late November early December. It meant that we went from creating 101 level briefing memos to like 401 level briefing memos. This is a person who knows um, USDA inside and out and and I, I suspect that uh, President Biden asked Secretary Vilsack to return because he recognized that there was no time to waste in terms of, of bringing in somebody who just would take months, maybe, you know, over a year to figure out where the lights are, how the programs are run, you know, especially when we outlined a series of challenges, including massive reorganizations, depleted staff, you know, thought about how can we immediately unlock partnerships to uh, for, for things like vaccine delivery and things like that. So, uh, you know, I don't have a good answer for you on that. What I, what I can say is that I think um, Vilsack is a man for the moment when it comes to crises. And I think that the, the president really understood that having somebody who can at least be reactive is going to be supremely important. What that being said, I, you know, I, I, it's only speculation here, but one of the things that I heard you know, the secretary saying and others kind of closely advising him is that he's evolved a bit, I think, you know, and to, to be determined what that means. But I think, again, based on his comments here, recognizing that climate change is not like a nice to have, it is absolutely core to what his administration is going to be focused on. Um, what that means, again, in terms of actual innovation and dollars, to be determined. That's why we need every single one of you to apply for jobs in the administration, to go and work on the Hill, to think about you know, joining nonprofits and, and apply pressure both internally and externally to make sure that we don't, we don't you know, lose time on, on progress. So you know, I think, do I think it's gonna be a radical shift? No, but I also think that Secretary Vilsack is a very pragmatic person. He, you know, he sees the, the market data for alternative proteins he, um, he understands that we need market-based solutions. We need incentive, incentives for farmers. He also understands that the, um, that the average age of the US farmer is something like 60 years old. And to inspire new, new farmers to come into agriculture, um, we're gonna need to talk about things that are quite frankly a bit sexier. And I think the all protein space provides that opportunity. So, you know, again, not totally sure. Again, I think it's gonna be based on what what his actual inner team looks like. So early signs um, point to right now more of a focus on things like conservation um, and, and thinking about um, 
a carbon bank uh, as incentives for farmers to to kind of pay them for for you know smarter climate friendly practices. But like I mentioned, I think that opportunity is really going to be there on the federal R and D side, um, and I also think that with uh, I think it, a, a new team of appointees that actually have quite impressive um, kind of policy regulatory um, thought leadership experience on these issues are they're some of the most qualified people to serve in these roles ever again these are like historically very patronage positions you kind of plop somebody from you know your state into running this program and they you know, are suddenly in charge of the rural electric service, and they don't even know what that means, right? So now, now we're at the point that we actually have really, really smart experts running these programs, and I think there is kind of more, more, pro, a more progressive bent than there there has ever been before at, at agriculture. Yeah, I heard a really stunning statistic that the ratio of uh, farmers over sixty five to those under thirty five was six to one, or something like that. I mean, it's pretty pretty astounding when you think of you know then. How that how that moves forward. Um, we've got a few more questions. Just sticking on the USDA real quick. You know, USDA has historically been in a split personality role of being charged with both promoting and regulating the agricultural industry. Um, there's a perception among many in the animal protection community that whenever there's a, a conflict or a tension between those two mandates, the agency usually defaults to promoting over regulating. Is there any universe in which you could see those two roles being sort of split up or bifurcated and given to different governmental units or even agencies? That is a really interesting question. I mean, you know, I worked at the marketing and regulatory mission area, which in, right there, you know, mandated by Congress, to, you know, built by Congress is that mission area that joins marketing programs with regulatory programs. So there is absolutely, I think that that inherent conflict. Um, I, I don't know if there will ever be a point at which, I mean, certainly the USDA couldn't do it. It would take, it would take congressional action and, and potentially some movement within, again, the, the, the next farm bill to see maybe a bit more of that decoupling. But, but what I'll say is that the, the primary focus really, the, the, the goal, kind of the central driving force was, is, is jobs. And so I think we really have to think about you know, especially on the alt protein side, what will the econ what will the kind of job landscape look like um, as this this industry and ecosystem expands? And if regulators, promoters, the Hill, you know, agency officials can see that as a new beacon of opportunity, particularly when it comes to rural prosperity, I do think that we'll see things shift a bit. But I think it really has to come down to that: is where you know where where are the dollars coming from? Yeah, great. Um, and you mentioned that Bill Gates has been giving GFI lots of love on social media in recent weeks, um, some of them being his like only tweets or messages like the entire week or day. Um, you know, if, if he decided, if Bill Gates decided to just give GFI a big blank check, uh, what would you spend it on? Uh, in other words, what aspect of GFI's work or the alt protein space more generally do you feel are most needing of additional resources? My gosh, I, I wish that we had our, uh, our director of science and te technology respect here to answer some of those questions. I think I think we're we're figuring that out. I think GFI is in the process of what well, we are in the process of redoing our strategic vision for the next five years and, and trying to get to the bottom of some of these questions. Again, we can't answer that in a vacuum because you know we've been operating and now as as I mentioned, a huge evolution and and you know growth spurt has happened across not just plant-based, but like as I mentioned, cultivated and a new pillar of, of fermentation derived products. And so to really figure out like, okay, where is there, where are there white spaces in terms of, of, you know, scientific research as well as commercialization, we're, we're really trying to get um, zero, zeroed in on that a bit more. But I know one of the main areas of focus is, is, to, is really trying to fund research centers. So dedicated research centers that are multidisciplinary for cultivated meat, plant-based meat, and fermentation-derived meat, um, because those centers are the ones that should really be thinking about all of the gaps in research, really be putting, you know, sharing information um, in an open access type of way so that all of this 
um, innovation and research isn't happening in house um, in, in the companies that are best funded so that we can provide, you know, again, information like what are the best crops to be using um, to, to companies that don't, again, have to spend a bunch of time to kind of dupli duplicating efforts behind the scenes. So um, research centers is one, one big uh, area of focus. And I think I see here too, you know, international policy advocacy and really focus on global expansion. Um, you know, we have our, our GFI team in, in the US, but we also have five regions in the world in which we operate. And those teams are, are growing, but they're still rather small. Um, but what, what I kind of, it, it, it really blows my mind when I think about even in, in two or three years, again, you look at Israel, it, the Israel team is, is quite new, I think two or three years old. They've already gotten their head of state to taste cultivated meat. They've got, they're working with them on a national policy plan, like the, the infiltration, if you will, um, at the highest levels of government in places like Israel is really quite remarkable. And again, we're seeing similar things in, in Asia. And I think really focusing on that Asia region will be um, fantastically impactful moving forward, just given that that's where the consumers are gonna be. And I think that is also where um, a lot of innovation is happening and, and certainly on the science side, we know that uh, if you fund science in, in China, it will help you know people in Brazil. So science is global, and so I think as much money as we can put towards science is is going to be um, impactful and, a, and a, a major priority for GFI. For sure, and and you know certainly internationally, but even domestically as well. Do you think with the new administration and leadership at the USDA or elsewhere in the federal government that we? We'll see begin to see private match uh, matching funds into uh, alternative proteins. Matching funds from from the government uh, to begin uh, matching private investment in alternative proteins. So, like you're saying, providing financial incentives or or research programs or something like that. I mean, I know we've seen a couple of bills at the state level trying to incentivize that, but um, anything happening there at the federal level you can share or that you can mm -hmm. anticipate. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll say we started small. GFI actually has a directory, a database of all of the kind of grants given to date by governments, in, including the US, but also all over the world. Um, it's a pretty small database because there hasn't been that much funding given by, by public entities like that. But one really, really exciting thing last fall that happened was the first ever cultivated meat grant from the federal government to university provided um, from the National Science Foundation to, uh, I think it was to UC Davis, for cultivated meat um, research and to really answer some of these essential white spaces and gaps and technological challenges that we know exist. So that I think is a really, really promising sign of, of hopefully you know, a windfall of, of funding to come. Um, we have also seen a couple of grants coming from, from places like the um, Agricultural Research Service um, and the National Institute for Food, Food and Agriculture within USDA to fund really specific things like, um, you know, pea, po pea protein um, extraction and things like that. So I think there was actually a grant from USDA back in 2014, uh, don't quote me on the year, that um, to, to the University of Missouri that then um, that research was foundational for the formation of Beyond Meat. So that's why we're really, really keen on this kind of funding, because we know that even, even kind of small scale research grants like this can spur what is now one of the hottest, you know, IPOs on the market. Oh, you're muted, Chris. <laughs> uh, looks like we might have time for one more question. Uh, this one's from one of our students, Susanna Benjamin. Uh, she asks, how significant do you think Biden's new environmental plan will be in transitioning farmers from factory farming to sustainable agriculture and helping them escape some of the debt slash structural issues that keep them tied to CAFOs? Uh, how can we as advocates encourage Biden to target sustainable agriculture and steer farmers away from growing crop feed? Uh, beyond lobbying for an increase in subsidy grants for farmers transitioning to sustainable ag, what else can we do? Oh my God, what a fantastic question. And one that I, I really don't think has been ex explored enough, right? So I think um, it, we probably in, in this room and in the, you know, in this conversation right now, definitely see that as a, as a core, core lever that needs to be pulled to, to really make this, this industry thrive. But I think, um, I think the reality is that we, we won't know yet. There's a lot of policy options, I think, being considered by the new administration around what will, what will happen. Um, 
but I, I'm encouraged by kind of, again, you know, what was happening in California, GFI helped co-sponsor with others this bill to help um, farmer transition into plant-based proteins, for example. But one of the things I keep coming back to is the sense that now that the industry is, you know, at least five years old, you know, a little bit more mature than that, we really need to think about an approach to bring, to bring um, kind of the alternative protein companies and players um, with farmers and with the USDA to say, hey, here's demand, here's sales, here's our expected volume needs, here are the inputs that we'll need. Like, we just simply cannot get it um, given current supply chains within the US. They're, they're, you know, importing the majority of those inputs particularly if you think about things like organic um, and, and pea protein, chippy protein. And, and then when you think about the need to increase biodiversity through some of these inputs as well, that is a role that USDA could really play in being that convener to say, okay, well, if this is a, an opportunity for farmers, they can, they can maybe even transition maybe not all the way from, from where they currently are, but at least take a portion of their acreage and, and start growing and um, have some contracts and have some guarantees from the industry about supplying into, into you know, plant-based meat production, for example. I think USA would be really open to playing a role like that. It just, I think we'll, we'll take a coalition of, of partners and advocates to really say, hey, we, we need this matchmaking, if you will, to happen. But the, I think it, it's time for you know, the industry to really think um, as almost as one to, to have these conversations around farmer transition in particular in the way that we've seen, you know, the, the, the major meat industries really, really kind of secure these contracts, really think about how to make sure that their, their supply chains were nice and firm and secure. So um, but an excellent question, one that I know a ton of different organizations are exploring like uh, mercy for animals at a small level with, with transformation, you know, things happening at the state level, um, but, but write write to the Secretary of Agriculture, write to his team, they'll read it, they have to respond to these letters. And even, even writing in with these issues as somebody who had to receive these letters and maybe look over the draft responses makes you have to kind of think about them, request meetings to talk about these issues. Like you'll, you'll be surprised at the power that this type of outreach has, even, even a small letter or a request for a meeting, you know, it, it can have a, a, a pretty huge ripple effect. So I think the time is absolutely now to start, you know, planting these seeds within the new administration. Wonderful. Well, we are at our time. So I, I can't thank you enough for taking some of your time out of your busy work and schedule to help educate uh, us internally at Harvard Law School and uh, the broader community uh, out there about the, about these issues and your prior work um, and providing an inspiration for people to, again, to, to think of different roles that they might be able to play that may be outside of their, their current realm of uh, a consideration. Um, and with that, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees uh, for uh, participating in Animal Law Week this week. It's been one of my uh, favorite ones so far in my five years here. Uh, and especially thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Animal Law Society, and also specifically our own staff, Kelly Reddy and Sarah Pickering, for all their great work in helping make this wonderful week a, a reality. So thank you again, Sana Beg, and thank you to everyone, and we'll see you again. Thanks so much, Chris. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.